This episode of Ben Franklin's World is brought to you by DelanceyPlace.com. DelanceyPlace.com offers a brief daily email with interesting excerpts or quotes for you to consider. And many of the selected passages in the emails come from history books, like Sven Beckert and Seth Rockman's Slavery's Capitalism. DelanceyPlace.com's email about slavery's capitalism highlighted the conflicted relationship between slaveholding and non-slaveholding states. For example, the email reprinted Baltimore Minister Alexander McCain's statement that, quote, many of the abolitionists feel such abhorrence of slavery that they will not wear the cotton of the South because it has been cultivated by slaves. Yet these extremely sensitive and preeminently holy characters feel no qualms of conscience to sell Southern planters their boots and shoes, their Negro cloth, and all the etc. that make up a cargo of Yankee notions, and to put that money arising from the labor of slaves in their pockets, end quote. For more thought-provoking quotes and ideas from history, sign up for DelanceyPlace.com's free daily email. Text nonfiction to 22828 or visit dp1776.com. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's world will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 125 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. How did everyday people live in early America? That's the question about history you ask me most often. And it's a big question, because early America was a diverse place with many different peoples who had many different traditions that informed how they lived. Still, yours is an important question, and that's why we're going to keep chipping away at an answer to it. And today, we're going to add one more piece to the answer to your question by exploring the everyday lives slaves lived and why these lives prompted some slaves to commit acts of suicide or self-destruction. Death goes hand in hand with life. And this was especially the case in early America, where mortality rates were just much higher than they are today. So during our exploration, Terry Snyder, the author of The Power to Die, Slavery and Suicide in British North America, reveals why we need to study and understand death and suicide in early America, how 18th century Europeans, Euro-Americans, and Africans understood and viewed suicide, and what the historical record reveals about why some slaves committed acts of self-destruction and how some anti-slavery reformers use slaves' acts to further their cause. But first, as a reminder, tomorrow night, which is Wednesday, March 15th, I'll be hosting a big book giveaway in the Ben Franklin's World community at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you'd like to participate, be sure you're a member of our Facebook group. It's free and easy to join. All you need to do is text BFWORLD to 33444 or visit BenFranklinsWorld.com and click on the orange Join Now button on the homepage. And if you're listening to this episode after March 15, you should still join the group. Not only will there be more book giveaways in the future, but in addition to sharing news and conversations about history, we're starting to organize meetups around the United States. Are you ready to explore some of the culture that surrounded early American life and death? Allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is a professor of American studies at California State University, Fullerton. Her research focuses on the intersections of law, gender, and race in early America, and she's the author of two books, Brabbling Women, Disorderly Speech in the Law in Early Virginia, and most recently, The Power to Die, Slavery and Suicide in British North America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Terry Snyder. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Liz. Terry, we know from speaking with other historians who study slavery that slavery is a difficult topic to research and discuss. But you haven't just studied the history of slavery in early America. You've studied the role suicide or self-destruction played in the history of slavery. Would you tell us how you came to this topic? Sure. It was not a straight path. I actually came to this topic while I was doing research for my first book on women in early Virginia. I was reading lots of county court records, and I came across references to suicide. These weren't references to suicides by slaves. These were random coroner's reports that mostly concerned the suicides of indentured servants. 
So very young, I would say under the age of 20, mostly men, but a few women who came to Virginia as bonded laborers killed themselves. It's hard to say how many or how frequently, but I did find a cluster in the county, York County, that I studied. And the word I always use to describe what happened is that they kind of haunted me. So they really didn't play a role in the book at all. But I sort of set them aside. And when I would have free time, I would try to figure out who these people were. Where did they come from? What were their histories? And like so many early Americans, I ran into a dead end. But their stories kind of stayed with me. And so I began collecting any references to suicide that I came upon. And as I moved from the 17th into the 18th century, there were increasing numbers of references to suicide by enslaved people. And those were the deaths that very much intrigued me. I think initially I thought, okay, I'll do a book that studies suicide in colonial British North America. It was really then the suicides of slaves that I saw had this very deep cultural and political meaning that I wanted to trace. Why should we study suicide? I mean, why do you think it's important for us to try to better understand the role that suicide played in both slavery and in early American life? Well, as a category of death, suicide is universal throughout human history. And it's also been a universally problematic kind of death. Suicide in many countries was punished in very specific ways. I can talk about that a little bit more later. But for Christian countries, it was a sin. It was also a felony against the crown. And it carried significant ramifications within early modern communities. So death, I think, is something that historians have always paid attention to. For your early American audience, David Stannard's Puritan Ways of Death is a classic. But suicide as a particular category of death has been something that European historians have given more attention to. But in the last 10 years, early Americanists have come to the topic as well. And what does the study of death, particularly the history of suicide, reveal about death and the histories of slavery in North America? Well, first of all, that deliberately or not, suicide by slaves pointed out the contradictions of slavery in North America. So here you have this act undertaken by a person who is legally and culturally defined as property, but yet this is an anguished act of personhood, right? So it encapsulates that contradiction of slavery in very visceral and human terms. And I think that is important to the history of slavery and the history of the United States. As you just mentioned, suicide or self-destruction was an act that demonstrated personhood. And most historians would see a self-destructive act as signifying a slave's agency, basically an ability by slaves to make free choices about their lives. But in The Power to Die, you warn that we really need to avoid the trap of exploring and explaining slave suicide in terms of agency and resistance. Would you tell us more about why we need to avoid viewing slave suicide as a free choice? You've heard the phrase, people are agents of their own destiny, that somehow agency is classically defined as a means of exerting power, right? the capacity that a person might have to act in any given environment. And so when you talk about agency in the context of slavery, it seems to me that you have to acknowledge that agency has its limits, right? An enslaved person is faced with a choice. There are limits on what that enslaved person can do. There are limits on how they can act in any given situation. Their lives are conditioned by slavery. So that's one of the cautions I would suggest is that agency implies a self-determination that it's sort of wrong to assume that slaves possess. And also, it seems to me that the idea of agency being a means for enslaved people to preserve their humanity ought to be the end of historical inquiry rather than the beginning. And so when it comes to resistance, historians of slavery have spent a lot of time talking about the resistance of slaves, and rightly so. Right? We think about resistance as collective events, such as revolt. We think about resistance in terms of everyday actions, work slowdowns the way that enslaved people attempt to control their bodies and their spaces, running away, use of clothing, all of these actions can be seen as forms of resistance. What bothered me was when we come to suicide, that one of the things that I found is that historians would describe suicide by slaves as the ultimate act of resistance. And I kept getting stuck on that. I could find that in several studies. People would write about forms of resistance. They would come to 
suicide, they would remark on it anecdotally as the ultimate form of resistance and move forward. And I kept getting stuck on the idea that that's all that suicide was, right? If someone kills themselves today or a free white person kills themselves in 18th century America, it was seen through a particular lens. And I felt that to say that suicide for slaves only meant resistance was to strip it, to strip that very powerful anguished act of most of its meaning. So I felt like it had to be studied further. Along those lines... Could we explore European, Euro-American, and African understandings of suicide in the 18th century? I mean, what is or what are the larger meanings about suicide that have captivated you? When I first came across a reference to suicide by an indentured servant in early Virginia, so when I just had a glimmer of the idea of doing this study, one of the things that intrigued me was the punishment. So there was a coroner's report and the the servant had killed themselves. They used the word willfully. So this was a conscious act, not the act of someone who was mentally unsound. But the order from the court was to take the body to a crossroads and stake the body, right? Drive a stake through the body and bury it in that way. And that punishment intrigued me, right? And what that punishment reflects, it reflects a couple of different things. One is that European traditions for punishing suicide, as I said earlier, it was considered to be a felony as well as a sin. And so the violation against Christian norms meant that suicides were often denied burial rights. They were often denied the right to be buried in burial grounds. And they tended to be buried, as was this young person, away from that place that other community members might visit and commune with the dead, right? And keep the dead sort of as part of the community. Suicides were outcasts under early modern Christianity as well as the law. The legal penalties meant that if you committed suicide, you forfeited your personal estate. So if, let's say, the head of a household, the male head of a household committed suicide, it had the power to impoverish his family or at least lessen their assets, their personal assets, not their real estate, but their personal assets. And then the community as well had its rituals for dealing with the bodies of suicides so that for killing oneself, one was corporally punished after death. So various post-mortem punishments, sometimes, as I mentioned, the burials outside of the churchyards, but corpses of suicides could also be buried upside down. They were staked. Sometimes they were burned. They were desecrated in various ways. So all of that signals that suicide is a major violation of Christian belief. So those traditions come to America, although over the course of the 18th century, there is much less attention paid to punishing the bodies of English and European suicides in the ways that I've just described. Those practices wane over the course of the 18th century and actually then are finally outlawed. So that sets the European scene. We know far less about how Africans regarded suicide. But there is some evidence, which I cite in the book, that for some African countries, suicide constituted a specific form of death that was punished by irregular burial. And I also cite and discuss in the book at least some evidence that among the Ipo, those who committed what we would call capital crimes. So if an individual killed another individual, the punishment was to hang oneself. So that tradition may have played a role as the Igbo were brought to North America on the slave ships as well. So it seems like there were cultural differences in the ways that Europeans and African peoples viewed suicide. And it also seems like in the European Christian tradition, the punishment for suicide was a bit of a double standard in that the most severe punishment, it sounds like, was inflicted not on the dead, but on living women. Because if a woman's husband killed himself, then they would have been left without his personal property. Right. Again, if a male head of household killed himself, it was going to have an impoverishing effect on his family. If a woman killed herself, that effect wouldn't apply, right? Because unless she had made arrangements for a separate estate, her husband would be in control of the real estate and the personal property as well. So there wouldn't be that kind of economic effect on the family. So there is a gendering of the effects of suicide, definitely. Now, I don't know about you, But when I think about slave suicide, I think of the poor people experiencing the Middle Passage, crammed into ships' holds and without a lot of information about where they were going and what would happen to them. Terry, would you tell us about the Middle Passage and whether suicide played a role on this journey? One begins to see acts of suicide by enslaved people, I think, as soon as Europeans are loading the slaves onto ships on the African coast. 
And some of the reports are ambiguous, so that there are certainly attempts by Africans to jump the ship and swim back to shore. But farther out, Africans will continue jumping off the ship as well as refusing to eat. Those were the two principal methods that enslaved Africans used as suicide aboard the Middle Passage. Occasionally, there were hangings, but typically it was jumping overboard or refusing to eat. So the threat of suicide was a constant presence on slave ships in the Middle Passage. And for those who survived, I mean, it's hard to say greater in this context, but the crews of slave ships were alert for suicide attempts. They believed that suicide was, in a sense, contagious, that once one slave jumped, sometimes another would jump and another would jump. So it was important to them to surveil the ship and to prevent suicide as much as possible. And they did this sometimes through chaining enslaved captives in the holds of the ships. But even when they brought them up, there were often nets placed around the ship so that the slaves couldn't jump off. And they had instruments that they used to forcibly feed slaves who refused to eat. But if a slave was successful in actually jumping off a ship or committing suicide through starvation, did their acts cause any problems for the enslaved still on board the ship? Yes, I think it did. First of all, in the context of the Middle Passage, which is what we know about it is horrifying, to then be a witness to constant death, either through disease, epidemics that run through the ships, through deprivation, or through suicide means that you're also in an environment where death is a constant. And again, in attempts to suppress suicide, one of the things that ship captains would do is that they would order the bodies of those who committed suicide to be thrown overboard. And because slave ships were followed by sharks to allow the sharks to attack and destroy the corpse. And other slaves would be gathered on board to witness this. Or there are also reports of slave captains decapitating the corpses of slaves who had killed themselves and, again, requiring that other slaves watch this. So the aftermath of a suicide could be occasion for which captains would inspire further terror in their enslaved cargo. So I think there's also very much an emotional and psychological effect as well. In your research, did you ever find slaves finding, I don't know, perhaps inspiration in an enslaved person's suicide? I mean, did suicide ever inspire slaves on board a slave ship to, say, revolt or commit other defiant acts? I don't know if inspiration is the word, but I think that when a slave is able to jump overboard, it suggests that there are weaknesses in the ship discipline. In a perfectly run slave ship, this wouldn't happen. A slave would never be physically able to escape over the board of the ship, but it did happen. And I think what you see is that once one slave jumps, that others will follow. There is a fairly famous case of a ship that is anchored off Jamaica, in which 100 slaves jump over at a command given by one of them. So I'm not sure if it inspires is exactly the right word, but it can provide the occasion. One suicide can provide the occasion for other suicides to occur or revolt. After the Middle Passage, most slaves destined for North and South America and the Caribbean went through a process of seasoning. Terry, would you tell us about this seasoning process? Well, seasoning is, according to 18th century sources, they think of it as a phase of slavery that lasts for about two years. And what they mean by seasoning is the time that it takes a captive African to be accustomed to the colony, to sort of get accustomed to the labor regimes and the plantation discipline. And particularly in the Caribbean, the period of seasoning is also a period of very high mortality. So in that sense, it's the differences between the middle passage and the seasoning itself are sometimes not so great, right? Once slaves are boarded onto a ship in Africa and they make the journey across to North or South America or the Caribbean, during that journey, and Marcus Redeker argues this fairly convincingly, they they develop ties, right? They become shipmates. What seasoning does is it destroys those ties because you land on the coast of, let's say, Jamaica, but you're going to be dispersed again, right? All of those slaves are going to be sold to various different owners and they will be dispersed. So those bonds are broken just as they were right when slaves were taken captives in Africa. So those newly forged bonds are broken. It's a period of high mortality. And so unsurprisingly, perhaps, at least in the Caribbean, the evidence is that suicide often occurs among slaves who are unseasoned. 
or what they sometimes call saltwater slaves. How much did the labor systems and the treatment slaves experienced in 18th century British North America contribute to their, I mean, I guess we could call it a decision to commit suicide? Right. In the book, I use the phrase, die by suicide, because I think I want to pull back a little bit from always calling it a choice. But let's go with the idea that it's a decision. Yeah, the labor systems definitely play a role. You see, there's much more evidence of suicide in the Caribbean, right, in the Sugar Islands, especially than there is in mainland North America. For a couple of reasons. One is there is a House of Commons does a big investigation of England's, you know, role in the slave trade, particularly on slavery in the Caribbean. And they directly ask most everyone they interview if the slaves are committing suicide. So, I mean, that kind of investigation doesn't exist in North America for that period. And this is done in the very late 18th century. So one could draw the conclusion that it is a specific sort of labor regime of the sugar production, which we know has a very high mortality rate. Planters are cautioned that they're going to lose 30% of their slaves in the first three years. That's a phenomenally high mortality rate. So in that context, just as on a ship, suicide is also elevated. So it may be the same for tobacco as well, but we just don't have the evidence such as the Commons investigation, in which planters are directly being asked, do your slaves kill themselves? Right? But I assume that something similar happened in North America as well. Are there any records that reveal why slaves chose to die by a method of self-destruction? I know it's hard to question the dead, but did you ever find a case where someone attempted suicide, lived, and then explained what they were thinking? Right. Well, the first answer is no, because so many of the records we have about slavery are filtered through the pens of enslavers or legal clerks, people who had an interest in the system of slavery. We do have one fairly well-known case of a woman who jumped out of an attic window in Washington, D.C. in 1815, and her name was Anna. Actually, she later sued for her freedom under the name of Anne Williams. But she's interviewed by well-meaning anti-slavery reformers who actually go to view her body because they believe that she's dead. She jumps out of the attic window. She breaks both of her arms. Her spine is broken, but she recovers. And she's interviewed and she tells them that she sort of gives them a capsule autobiography in which she says that she was sold unexpectedly. She had been sold before in her life, but her first sale was to her husband's owner on a Maryland plantation. And then he died and she was transferred to his son and the son sold her without giving her any warning. And the slave trader took her and two of her daughters away from the plantation on which she labored with her husband without letting her say anything to him. She was trafficked like many slaves in this period. She was trafficked through Washington, D.C. She was housed in a tavern in Washington, D.C. And actually, she was in the tavern with some kidnapped free blacks as well. The trader was just assembling a coffle, right? And she talks about the fact that she panicked. She did not want to go. She did not want to leave her husband. And she uses the word distracted, which in the early 19th century is a code for mental distress. She was distracted. She was confused. And she jumped out of the window. So she later says, in retrospect, not unlike people who attempt suicide today, but do not fully follow through on it, she said she was sorry that she did it. Now, I think what's interesting about her story is that the reformers are trying to use her story to demonstrate why the problems with the domestic slave trade and specifically why the domestic slave trade should be eliminated. That's sort of a difficult rhetorical trick. Remember, suicide is a reviled act. So one of the things they do in telling the stories is to emphasize the fact that she's distracted, she's not of sound mind, and that she was responding through passion and an impulse. She was giving in to an impulse that she later knew was wrong. But they have to kind of make sure that she's depicted as on the moral high ground in order to generate sympathy for her story and therefore generate support for their opposition to the domestic slave trade. That's really interesting. Is Anna's story the first one that abolitionists or anti-slavery reformers used to promote their cause? No, there are earlier examples. The best known and widely circulated account of slave suicide comes at the period of the revolution and 
It's an interesting case. It begins with a news item that's printed in the London papers, but also then makes its way to the colonial papers in 1773. And it's the account of an unnamed enslaved man who had accompanied his master to London and while in London escaped from his master and was about to be baptized, which is, you know, could be seen as an avenue out of slavery, was about to marry a white woman, a fellow servant, when he was recaptured by his master's agents and taken back to the ship, and he was going to be shipped to the West Indies. And according to the news item, he shot himself in the hold of the ship. And then two lawyers take that case and they write a poem about it called The Dying Negro. And the title of my book comes from that poem. So that's really the first case in which you see anti-slavery advocates using suicide to symbolize what is wrong with slavery. So did the lawyer's tactic work? Did the poem actually help them gain momentum and support for their cause? Yeah, that's harder to answer. What we can say is the piece circulated. It was well known. It was reprinted. So it had an audience. There was actually even a ballad that took its name from the poem called The Dying Negro, but the ballad itself didn't reference suicide. So yes, you could say this story had legs. It did remain in the popular consciousness or in political consciousness through the early 19th century. Another tactic that anti-slavery and abolitionist advocates took was to use and commission narratives by slaves to demonstrate the evils of slavery and thereby promote their cause to end it. And earlier, Terry, you mentioned that there was a report conducted in the Caribbean to assess slave suicide, but that it came filtered through the views of the enslavers. And I wonder, did slave narratives, which were supposedly written by slaves, ever remark on slave suicide? And if so, did they offer a different viewpoint from that offered by whites? Absolutely. So when we think of slave narratives, there are different forms. Literary scholars who write about slave narratives write about sort of the autobiographical forms, the biographical forms, the fictionalized forms of slave narratives. The majority of these are published after 1830, but even those that emerge in the 18th century reference suicide. I think David Silkenat was the first person to point out that there doesn't seem to be a slave narrative that doesn't talk about suicide. But at any rate, the way that I read these is that obviously <laughs> the frame of the slave narrative means that you have an individual, Charles Ball, Harriet Jacobs, for instance, who, I mean, they're the centers of the story. They're on an epic journey. And they're really witnesses to slavery and they're survivors of slavery. But one of the things they witness in their accounts is the suicide of other slaves. Sometimes it's just a very brief mention as though Jacobs writes about a woman who had been beaten and rushed past her and just jumped into the river. Ball talks about a newly imported African that he encounters who, you know, was a sort of a repeat truant and eventually also a suicide. So they witness the suicides of others, and they also discuss their own suicidal thoughts. They do this in very gendered ways. Harriet Jacobs writes about the fact that she got sick on one occasion, and she wished that she would never be made well again. She wished to die. So it's, women tend to express this passively, not always, but that is definitely a pattern, whereas Charles Ball openly says, you know, at this point, if I had had a rope, I would have hung myself. So they tell us both about the suicides of other slaves as well as their own suicidal impulses as a product of slavery, right, or as an effect of slavery. Throughout the course of our conversation, we've talked about a survey done by the British government to learn more about slavery. We've talked about poems and newspaper reports, and we've talked about slave narratives, and these are just some of the sources that you discuss at the end of The Power to Die, where you spend several pages talking about the different historical sources you used, and ultimately, how hard it was to find information about slave suicide. Would you tell us more about the sources you looked at and why slave suicide is almost completely absent from them? I started with lots of legal documents, specifically coroner's inquests and court records, because these accounts of suicide, because suicide was a felony, accounts are going to be found in the legal sources. But of course, since slaves stand outside of the law, right, in the sense that they don't have legal personhood, there's no obligation for enslavers to report the suicides of their slaves to the county court or to the coroner or have them investigated by the coroner. That happens. We do find those coroner's reports 
very few of them, but there's still some coroner's reports on enslaved people. So that is one source of information. And so I looked at coroner's reports from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and some from Maryland as well. So the flip side of the coroner's reports is to understand the laws governing suicide as well as slavery. I also found in legal sources, another set of legal sources, particularly in Virginia, it's really rich in this regard. And this was sort of one of the original sources I came upon when I was doing the study at the very beginning. But the House of Burgesses received petitions from Virginians over a variety of concerns. And one source of petition came from slave owners whose enslaved men or women had killed themselves and slave owner was seeking compensation. So in other words, under the right circumstances, if you owned a slave who killed herself, you could potentially be compensated by the colonial government or the state government later for that slave's value. And the circumstances were if that slave had been committed or accused of a capital felony. Right. And we should bear in mind that running away could qualify as a capital felony. So if you had made the statement that your slave was outlying, that is run away permanently, or if your slave had been accused of killing another slave or killing an overseer, and then that slave killed themselves, you could declare yourself sort of a grieved party and gain compensation. So those petitions were another source of information. But I am a cultural historian. So I also wanted to see if I could find out how often slave suicide happened and how it was treated under the law. But I was also interested in seeing how it was discussed in newspapers and periodicals, on the stage, in print. And then finally, the final section of the book is about the study of suicide in the memories of ex-slaves who were interviewed in the early 20th century. So to do this study, I had to be interdisciplinary or range across various fields of history and humanistic study. Let's go into the time warp. Normally, this is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. But today, Terry, we're going to let you use our time machine so that you can travel back into Ben Franklin's world. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. If you could travel back to 18th century British America to investigate slave self-destruction, where would you go and what kind of information would you look for? And how would the new information that you find or hope to find deepen our understanding of the history of slavery in British North America? Well, where would I go? I would go to South Carolina. I would go to Jamaica. And I would also go, I think, to Maryland. I'd want to go several places. To me, the question is, what would I look for? I would talk to enslaved people. I think until we get to the 19th century and the slave narratives you mentioned earlier, it's their voices that are absent from the study. It's their beliefs about slave suicide that I can get at sometimes, but not as often, I think, as I would like or uh, probably other historians would like. What did they think about it? How did they regard it? How did they explain it to one another? Those would be some of the questions that I would ask. That would be the information I would look for. Now that you've investigated and told the story about the people who kind of haunted you in the historical record, what are you researching and writing about now? I am working on a biography of a family, a family that had its beginnings, or at least for me, where I chart their beginnings in 1703 on the eastern shore of Virginia when a free woman of color marries an enslaved man. And she's also somebody I worked on in my first book. And her family and her life has remained a side project for me while I worked on the suicide project. And so my study follows both the couple and their six children as their lives unfold across the early Atlantic world in the 18th century. So it's really a study of changing race, family, and changing ideas of freedom over the course of the 18th century because the woman, Jane Webb, is free and her husband, Left, is enslaved. All of the children take their free status from their mother. So they remain free in an environment in which the meaning of freedom and slavery is changing fairly rapidly. So my goal is to follow their lives as they unfold across the 18th century. One, for instance, is sold into slavery illegally and gains her freedom back. She ends up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, 
Another is accused of fomenting rebellion with slaves on the eastern shore of Virginia. Others move to North Carolina. So my goal is to study that family. And one of the most exciting aspects of this project is that I have been contacted from some of the living descendants today. So I hope to incorporate their sense of their family history into this project as well. If we still have questions about slavery and suicide in 18th century British America, where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can get in contact with you? You can find more information about me on my faculty webpage, which also includes my email address. And I would be really happy to talk to anyone who wants to discuss this further. And you can also follow me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at Snyder underscore Terry. Terry Snyder, thank you so much for joining us and taking us through early American ideas about slavery, death and suicide. You're welcome, Liz. I really enjoyed it. Sometimes history and people of the past haunt historians. It's why some historians, like Terry, do the work that they do. They investigate the lives of people to uncover their stories and to get at how everyday people truly lived and died. In this case, Terry wanted to find out more about why some of the indentured servants and slaves she came across in her research committed suicide. Although many of us might assume the easy answer of they committed self-destructive acts because of the oppressive and often horrific lives that they lived, Terry advises us to think bigger. Slaves were conditioned by the practice of slavery, so we can't assume that an act of suicide was an ultimate act of resistance, because most slaves didn't possess the power to act on their own behalf in every situation. And as the example of Anna showed us, some slaves may have been driven unconsciously to attempt or commit suicide during moments of unspeakable trauma. Suicide, death, and slavery are tough topics to discuss and think about. Yet history and the study of history isn't always comfortable. And you know what? It shouldn't always be comfortable either, because the past was not idyllic. If we truly want to understand who we are and how we came to be who we are today, we need to grapple with these tough topics, too. You can find more information about Terry, her book, The Power to Die, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash one, two, five. Don't forget that tomorrow night, March 15 at 9 p.m. Eastern, there will be a book giveaway in the Ben Franklin's World community on Facebook. To participate, join the community. You can do this by texting BFWorld to 33444 or by visiting BenFranklin'sWorld.com and clicking on that orange Join Now button. And then just log into the community just before 9 p.m. Eastern. If you enjoy thinking about history, why not sign up for DelanceyPlace.com's brief daily email? You can sign up by texting nonfiction to 22828 or by visiting dp1776.com. And thank you to LancyPlace.com for sponsoring this episode and helping to make it possible. Finally, what other aspects of death in early America would you like to know more about? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.